Welcome to the Peak Mental Performance Podcast with Joe Shalero, optimizing your mental health and athletic performance one episode at a time. One. And welcome everybody to another episode of Peak Mental Performance. I have with me today Matt Massafilo. Matt played five years in the NFL and over that time he introduced the traditional Pacific Island drink Kava to his teammates and also founded his company Kavafied, um, which is doing some pretty cool stuff which we're going to talk about today. Uh, thanks for taking the time to do this today, Matt. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me, Joe. Sure. So before we get into Kava and what it is, um, I think it's gaining a little more popularity and, uh, and more information is getting out there. Um, before we get into that, um, can you give people a little bit of an idea about your background? Because I think it seems like your background from your family background to what you study in college and all that stuff seems to kind of culminate to bring you to this point. So um, can you give people a little idea of kind of where you're coming from? Uh, for sure. So I was born and raised in Eva Beach, Hawaii. Um, um, my dad was an immigrant from Tonga. Uh, my mom uh, was born and raised in Hawaii, so just little, uh, born into kind of like a culture clash of America and Tonga, um, being half half um, half white, half Tongan. Um, just growing up there in the melting pot that is Hawaii. I don't think I don't think there is any place quite like Hawaii in the world where. If you're only two different um, nationalities, you're kind of average when your friends are like 10 different uh, that have, or your friends who whose family's been in Hawaii for generations, they're 10 plus different uh, nationalities. <laughs> so I think that, that was that was kind of uh, the, the upbringing I had being in Hawaii, which is pretty unique as far as just your perspective on um, on things and then playing football. Uh, was what kind of the avenue that uh, helped me propel um, to uh, the likes of Stanford and then the NFL uh, and then now to uh, connecting it at all through uh, our, my, a company I started uh, that's Cobbified. Yeah, that's awesome. That's pretty interesting, like you said, about uh, like the melting pot of that area. I'm sure it's like an interesting cultural dynamic. Because there's so much tradition, but then there's so many traditions mixing together, right? Oh, definitely. I mean, that's that's the it's kind of a little Snapchat, I think, of what the the rest of the the U.S. is slowly becoming, uh, just the, the 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 meshing of different cultures as as we become a more globalized world. But with Hawaii, kind of just uh, a few generations ahead of that. Right. So, um, I had first heard about kava. Um, I think last year sometime, um, as I've been looking at all these, you know, since it's, um, and we'll talk about this, but since it has a lot to do with de-stressing and calming and things like that, I had come up with some research I was doing and then um, hadn't really looked much more into it. And then you had an article that came out on ESPN, which is really good, which I'm sure brought a lot more exposure to um, to kind of like the general public about uh, Kava and the things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. for, for people who are not familiar can you explain what kava is and kind of, um, I know it's, it's kind of unique in that there's a lot of cultural roots to it. So kind of just explain to people what it is if they're not really sure. Okay. So um, just it's kava, is, it's a shrub plant uh, only grown in the volcanic soil, rich volcanic soils of the South Pacific. Uh, it's related to the, the pepper family. Uh, the scientific name is Piper methicidum. And it, it's uh, farmed for its roots, so the the active the active uh, compound of it are the cavalactones that you you harvest um, from the roots, or you make the drink through the roots, and and it's uh, used for its sedating um, and relaxing properties. And culturally, throughout the thousands of years of the South Pacific, uh, it's become a, a quite the centerpiece of most of the island cultures. Uh, every, every island is a little different with their, how they, they use the drink uh, for their culture. Uh, with my background uh, in Tonga, it's, it's uh, the culture, most of the cultural practices wouldn't exist without kava. It's, it's really quite the centerpiece of, of uh, the customs of how things are run. Yeah, and it seems like from what I've read, in some areas it almost serves kind of similar to 
probably what like the general person would think of with like having a beer with their friends, right? It's kind of like a social social drink, right? Definitely. It's 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 a communal drink. It's it's the the drink that you end your day with. Uh, the drink uh, stories are are shared. And if you think if you think about just the history of Polynesia, there 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 was no written language until the missionaries came there uh, one to two hundred years ago. So. Uh, kava ceremonies or nightly, weekly kava gatherings were essential for the history of the culture to be passed down because it was it was at kava circles where the elders told stories and taught lessons to the youth, which which carried on from generation to generation. So there's a lot a lot tied into with kava that I think is some, even more powerful than the actual. Uh, compounds you're drinking the root from and 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 that part i think is starting to catch on in the u.s and why it's becoming so popular just because that sense of community that uh is intrinsic in drinking kava is starting to catch on with with uh places like kava bars where people are drinking a social lubricant like kava but still able to have uh, in-depth and clear conversations because they're mentally uh, not impaired. Yeah, it's really interesting of, of that whole concept of it being something that you use in community with people, but it's not, you know, if you sat and drank liquor for three hours and talked to the people, it's, it could be a mess really quick. So, And I know I had read in a, a few of the articles on your website and the ESPN article that um, you would had some teammates, right, that would enjoy kind of sharing that as like a team building kind of thing that you would do after practice and stuff, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's that's nothing new, I guess. It's just kind of being talked about now. It's uh, the kava culture has a long history in uh, the sport of rugby. I don't know if you watched the Olympics last year, but after Fiji won the the rugby sevens gold championship, they were. They they had a tanoa on the field and were drinking kava on the <laughs> field together. Um, it's just it's just uh it's used for all types of occasions. But yeah, just like that, it's 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 what the villages would still drink uh, at their town halls, and that's how things are discussed. It's just how it's just how good good and better uh, better communication uh, can happen around a kava circle because. Everything centralized around kava, kava. The relaxing properties takes that edge off. So you know, if you're coming into the the kava circle with prior judgments, the kava is something that can help you uh, think more clearly because it kind of takes that edge off. It it takes that guard you may have off, and you can actually ha you can actually have uh, good discussion. You know, on hot topics like politics or or whatever is troubling you in your community. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and I know that when I started looking more into what kava was, um, I know there's different types of kava, and I know even through your site, um, depending on where the kava is farmed from, there's different types of kava. So, like, what uh, can you kind of explain the differences between different types of kava to the uh, to kind of the general listener? Mm -hmm. Okay, so well. For kava, kava is a cultivated plant for one, so it, it doesn't it doesn't naturally reproduce on its own. The the first kava plant that had the effects that um, we drink today was a mutation of uh, another species thousands of years ago, and uh, farmers discovered this uh, in Vanuatu and cultivated that mutation. And over over the course of two to three thousand years. Uh, every farmer has cultivated their their strain of kava to meet, uh, meet their needs, and what I mean by that is the 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 active compounds are kava lactones in the kava root, and and there are about six major ones where the breakdown of of ratios of which uh, kava lactone is higher. Uh, in concentration is what uh, alters the effects. So you could have more, more kava that, or one 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 area that may grow kava, a, a cultivar that they preferred something more uplifting and not as sedating for whatever cultural reason they had when they cultivated it, and that, 
And so that cava will differ in that way, where, whereas you may find another species that was cultivated for more sedating properties. So it would be better for sleep, uh, better just to, to knock you out after a stressful day. So there, there's, there's a couple hundred cultivars out there um, and every, in every island you can kind of see uh, from an anthropological, uh, sorry, excuse me, from just looking at human history of the island and their cultural values, you can see, okay, why, why did they design this kava to do this? Because the culture has the, these types of methods and they wanted a kava to suit these needs. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's an ongoing thing. You know, mutations can still happen with the cultivars and, and new, uh, new kava species uh, can be created, which, which is exciting and also which, which puts a lot of uh, interest in research because it, it is, you know, one of your oldest forms of natural genetically modifying a plant is just by uh, the process of constantly farming kava and then if you find us one that's different than the others and like it then you take the cuttings from that and continue to farm that one as a separate species yeah that's it's definitely really interesting and the combination of like the cultivating process and we can get more into that and, and a lot of things you do a great job writing about on your website and then the tradition i think makes it really interesting and from uh you know you mentioned research um, I think it's pretty cool how, you know, they've done a little bit of research, you know, for people that they compared with generalized anxiety disorder, they compared versus, you know, prescription drugs like Xanax, and the people that used kava had very positive effects with very little downside, which is, I think, really cool because the, you know, a big focus of this podcast is mental health and mental health for athletes, and, you know, it's a big, it's obviously a big important topic, and, you know, a lot of times, a lot of the current solutions have a lot of downside too. So it seems like if there's something that can be beneficial for people that doesn't have as much downside, that's a you know something we're always looking for. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think that's kind of a, a common misconception with kava right now is that it may be new to just the the mainstream media, but it's it's been heavily researched for over a hundred years. It's it's gone through its cycle. Um, it's funny to, to look over a hundred years ago, you can see uh, manifest records of, of Germany exporting tons and tons of kava in the early uh, 20th century. Uh, so it just shows like the, the, as far as just pharmacies prescribing kava, it's, it's, it's been commonplace for over a century now. And you could scour through hundreds and hundreds of research articles uh, of them uh, researching it for everything from anxiety to uh, suppressing cancer cell growth um, to pain management. Uh, it's just, it's an ongoing thing. And I think more, obviously more research should be done, but, but it's, it's, it's been tested um, for over the course of time through, through research and also just the test of time. Yeah, and I think it seems like from a lot of the stuff that I of people I talk to on different topics and research different things related to um, these topics of like health and wellness and mental health, I think culturally in the U.S. and it may have something to do with more cultures getting plugged in to different areas, but I think we're starting to make a return to looking at what cultures have used historically for different things and seeing how beneficial those are versus you know, obviously there's plenty of uses and good, you know, it's not that medication or, or, you know, synthetic new things we create are bad, but we see that sometimes it's like, man, sometimes what people have been doing for thousands of years could work. <laughs> you know, there's a reason they've been doing it for thousands of years. Oh, absolutely. I think, I think that's just, we're, we're coming to realize, like, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we've created uh, in the last century is is awesome and needs to continue to be tested and researched but uh if you think about just us as an existence the the, only, the best the best test of all time is time and what what things are out there that have been used the longest like the the protein powder we take uh you know how much research is on that less than a century versus the organic herbal uh medicines that uh, humans have been using 
for thousands of years and have lasted that long and and we 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 as a species haven't died off so obviously it has to not be dangerous because if if it were killing us off, we wouldn't be here today by taking these things. Like, I think it's just it comes down to common sense, like that. Like, like, yeah, history. Yeah, history repeats itself. Just look, look to your past and learn from that, and apply it to what we have access to today. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think there's, you know, you look at what stood the test of time, and I think people are getting better at looking at that as like, hey, those are great clues to like, let's start taking steps back and looking about why they've been around. And, and this cop seems to be a great example of that. So mm -hmm. um, before we get into what, because a big part of your company is what you created with the Alu Ball, for before mm -hmm. kind of talking about that, so people understand why you made it, um, can you explain traditionally how Kava is made? Because I think a lot of people probably, if they saw it, wouldn't understand what was happening. Okay. Well, Kava is unique where a lot of people um, – mislabel it as a tea where where you, you steep it and brew it but it's it's a very special brewing process because the the active compounds which are cobalactones aren't water soluble so if you just steep it in hot water it won't brew anything up the the cobalactones are really like a, a glue like substance that needs to be agitated off the root uh, so without using extraction methods like CO2 extraction, uh, water-based extraction, you have to you have to squeeze the root or agitate it. So traditionally, the kava root was, was chewed. The, the, the maker would chew the root and then, and then spit it out into uh, a bowl, and then that's what you would drink. And obviously, we've ad advanced quickly from that to using things like... Uh, uh, the f fiber from like the how tree of just uh, of of using as a filter to squeeze the root, and uh, in more modern times, uh, the kava people have used strainer bags, muslin bags, cheese cloths, where you put the root or the root powder. You have to pulverize. You pulverize the root first into a powder, and with water in a muslin bag, you 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 squeeze the root and knead it for five to ten minutes to try to get the most out of the root or the, the cavalactones out of the root and then you drink that so that that's a very tedious process and and it's a great it's still the best way for making kava but the problem is is if you're trying to grow an industry of something so obscure how do you the first step is getting people to drink the kava because it's it's kava kava would sell itself once people start drinking it and and feeling the effects it's just how do you how do you get them to that that step and really right now the the i think in my opinion the reason why kava is making a wave right now is because is because of, of the kava bars so kava bars fill that void where people are able to try it without having to make it themselves. So you're getting more slow, organically getting more and more people uh, to drink kava or try kava and, and then it's catching on. So what I wanted to do was accelerate that process because kava bars are isolated where it's wherever their location are. Just like in Florida, there's, there's been kava bars here for over 15 years and only and only in the last five years when kava bars started popping up in in a lot of the, the big metropolitan areas across the U.S. where bloggers and, and uh, social media uh, influencers have gotten a hold of kava and started the conversation. So my thinking was if people aren't making it at home, you're limiting the exposure kava gets or or in anywhere in general so that was kind of the the objective with my company was how do you facilitate the growth and the the public re uh, reception of kava and that was by creating a, a mobile easy to use kava maker that i named olive ball yeah that's awesome and i uh, i just recently got one myself and i've really enjoyed it so far so the uh um, it is definitely interesting because when I was looking at originally how to make kava, yeah, that seems like that's the, probably the barrier of entry for like the average person. And mm -hmm. 
um, for people who haven't maybe seen it before, and we'll give your information for your website at the end, but um, can you describe kind of what the alu ball is and how it works? So the alu, the alu ball is a specialized ball that is designed to hold hold cover in there and and it has a filter uh, molded into the ball uh, that kind of just is a modified uh, tea bag like like a cover strainer would be and the process is is simply putting water in a bottle and then with the ball with the kava secured in the ball and just shaking shaking the ball in the bottle uh, for about 30 seconds to a minute and what what that does when when the the ball is in the bottle moving it it's it's mimicking the the traditional kneading process because you have a free flowing kavaru in the ball with the mass of the water and also the free moving mass of the ball so you're getting you're you're, you're doubling the force uh on the root at a couple couple hundred times a minute uh, which which maximizes the extraction process in in seconds rather than minutes of the traditional squeezing, and on top of that, the ball being spherical, you get even distribution of pressure on all the roots. Whereas when you're squeezing squeezing roots uh, traditionally, you're you may be agitating one part of the root and not the other. So it's just it's a simplified version. Uh, it's one of those things where we wanted I wanted to create where once once you once it was out it was like oh of course it's kind of one of those things always under your nose yeah. uh, where, where it's so simple but effective and and also too is just the the getting people over the hump not only in making kava but also just making it appeal to anyone uh the kava in its traditional form which is drank out of a coconut it's in a big bowl it's brown it looks like mud looks like dirt water uh that that's a hard sell in itself too. Not only the making process. It's it's you know if you're if you're out uh, at Whole Foods and a mom's shopping and you're like here try you have a big bowl of this muddy looking yeah. water. That's that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a tough sell. Right. Or, or if you just have something clean, mess free, in in a bottle that resembles that looks a lot like a shaker bottle. Uh, these days, it's it's already socially accepted. Any people will drink anything these days if it's in a shaker bottle. Right. <laughs> it's it's like they'll just they'll think it's healthy. It's a it's it's a, really a design problem in that in the the social stigma of it getting people over that hump uh, to enter the 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 kava world and then and then once once you have their attention then you can educate them on the the rich culture of kava. So it's eliminating that whole process because. Kava also tastes bad too. I mean, there's there there's a lot of barrier to entries for kava, and the olive ball eliminates half of them uh, because that's that's it's just kind of how kava is. So. Right. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. And the uh, you know, I think what's what I've appreciated as I've looked more at what you're doing um, with Kava Fide and your team over there is seems like a nice blend of like of kind of breaking down some of those barriers and bringing it to like the average person who otherwise wouldn't have known about it or tried it but still it's not like some like super commercialized like somebody just not paying any sort of respect or like providing any information about like where kava comes from or any tradition with it like it seems like you're trying to kind of strike a nice blend of of kind of making it more accessible but still you know, providing where the culture has brought it from, which I think is pretty cool. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's definitely our goal is to keep that balance. Um, yes, it's, you know, you have to utilize modern uh, technology to, to take Kawa to the next level, but you also have to respect <clears throat> where it comes from and also educate uh, people on the rich culture of Kava. And in my opinion, the... The, the conversation that comes with kava is just as beneficial to the therapeutic use you get from its medicinal properties like uh, the culture of sitting in a group with people and drinking kava for hours and having deep 
conversation that that in itself is its own therapy that you can't really uh get without kava you can't get it with alcohol as much if you drink after at some point it just becomes you're, you're unable to think so with kava that, that's that's the kind of uh, x factor of kava that you can't really measure and that's and that's another thing why these kava bars are, are so awesome they're popping up because people are discovering not only not only is the drink awesome the the people you meet there uh, no there's no other place you're going to go to and strike up a, a two hour long conversation with a random stranger uh and then leave the place like you've known that person for your whole life and that's just kind of part of the uh unmeasurable value of of kava and the culture that comes with it yeah i think that's really really cool um one of these days i'll be on my goal list to get to a kava bar it sounds pretty cool the uh um i know a, a big part of what you're doing with kava fight too with the different types of kavas that you sell is sustainability with the farming and cultivation that takes place um and it's pretty cool some of the blogs that i've read that you have on there can you explain a little bit about kind of like what your process or mindset is with how you're kind of supporting these farmers and cultivators there with uh kind of getting the product to you know the consumer yeah definitely so that's that's uh, on top of uh, another thing with kava that, that's holding its back holding it back is is the, the 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 yield time so kava kava takes three to four years to to mature before you can harvest and since you're harvesting the root after three to four years the whole plant dies because you have to take the roots and start all over from scratch so so that insanely long uh growth period uh limits the growth of the industry because right now millions of people can get into kava right now but the farmers just because it's spiked now we, there won't be enough supply to meet that demand for another few years because you can't just say all, all of a sudden oh we need to plant more kava well if the kava is needed now it won't be here for for that that time period so what, what we're doing where my my family my dad's from Hatua Ewa uh, Kolomaile in in Tonga is is doing a pilot program of looking at how how we can encourage more uh, kava growth because well well kava may be getting popular over here a lot a lot of the farmers uh, down in the South Pacific still still aren't sold on farming kava because of the the risk that all the natural disaster that can happen in four years and also just the the risk of everyone may want kava right now but they farm all this kava in four years and the demand goes away then then how are they going to make their money because the the cycle they've seen the cycle before uh, like i said the uh, kava has been researched and used extensively for over a century in the western world and and they, they've seen the demand come and demand go so so they a lot aren't, are, would rather just farm things like taro where they get a quick cycle and make money quicker. So that's, that's the, the big design challenge is how do, you, how do you convince more people to fa uh, farm kava. And uh, with my dad coming from there, it's, re it's just realizing you just have to kind of do it yourself at first. And then, and then once people see how big or how well your operation is going then they'll follow but no one's gonna no one's gonna really take that lead so we're, we're kind of taking that lead for that and and also uh for me personally it's just the way to empower uh the village where my family comes from just because if you just look at the economic standpoint of the South Pacific Islands, there there aren't many things that you can uh, export that you can compete on the glo uh, the global trade market, because you could you could farm coconuts there, but they can grow millions of those in Brazil and Thailand. Uh, you could do coffee, same thing, vanilla. They can grow that in Madagascar, other parts of the world for a lot cheaper. But kava is the one thing where it really only grows well, if not at all, in the South Pacific Islands. So as for, from agricultural, 
economic standpoint, that's their competitive advantage to uh, contributing to their GDP is through kava, uh, which which in turn helps the whole cycle because if you can create a sustainable uh, <clears throat> GDP for your country through kava, you're not you're not relying on uh, foreign aid. And also, you're not putting stress on your families that live overseas because there, there's almost twice as many Polynesians that live outside of the islands that that then live in the islands. And it's you know always just when when you migrate elsewhere. It, I, I think it's like that with with most cultures that immigrate into the U.S. It's just kind of that that dynamic of you kind of feel burdened to give back to where you come from but it, at the same time it puts a strain and a lot, and this kind of creates a system of of a way for them to have work to do because if if they have work to do if they they can if they know they can work hard and and farm kava and make a good living for themselves and better themselves it, they won't they won't be so dependent on everyone else living elsewhere so that's that's kind of the 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 big picture of of doing it down there and also, obviously, just it helping the industry. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I think, I think people, especially in like our generation and age, are starting to appreciate sustainability more. And so, seeing that is like a big part of what you're doing, I think, is pretty neat. So, um, and I think that kind of lends itself to what we've been talking about. Of like, you know, hopefully, if somebody chooses to use kava, that they're also kind of keeping up on like where it's coming from and how the farms are doing. And I think that's kind of like a cool extra connection versus something you just go to like CVS and buy and then you're, you know, it's like whatever. So mm -hmm. I think that's pretty cool. Um, for if there's somebody kind of, as we, as we wrap up, I think we've hit on some good topics. Um, if there's somebody interested in trying Kava for the first time, are there any things that you think are important for somebody to kind of, look for or to keep in mind um, I think you've mentioned quite a bit already but I know if you just like Google Kava a million things could come up for people so are there any kind of like beginner tips you'd have for somebody that's it's it's, it's similar to just buying any any type uh, oh, Kava, Kava another thing with Kava is it, it's still it's a gray area there's a push you know we want it to be classified like a food like how coffee and tea are because really that's what it is but Right now, the FDA still classifies it as a supplement. So with that comes all the unregulated uh, things like in the supplement industry. It's just knowing, okay, who's your manufacturer? What is, are, is what they say is in there actually in there? It's just, you just li really just look for transparency in where the kava is coming from because obviously as the demand gets higher, uh, more people are jumping into the market, which is great, but also it, it's just it, there has to be some accountability of of labeling what what you're actually selling and what it actually is. So I'll just look, I'll look for that. Just you know, read read through that part of of okay, is your vendor going through all the proper channels to ensure you're getting what you're actually getting and and I think that's a good uh, starting point for that. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was even just as I was researching more about it. I think one of the benefits of like the Kaba community is that the vendors that seem to do some like unethical practices seem to get identified pretty well by like the community and kind of put out there. So I think, you know, like you said, people doing a little bit of research um, to see like who are the reputable people that are recognized as like being transparent and doing a good job is, is definitely important because um, it's unfortunately typically those companies not doing it correctly or watering stuff down that then unfortunately Kava itself gets a bad name in those experiences but thankfully it seems like there's a lot of you know like yourself and other uh, some other groups doing good things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's not just the vendors too. It's it, it, it's the entire the entire chain. Everything from uh, farmers cutting corners to the the middlemen to manufacturers. Just because, uh, just like anything, the the cost of kava because because of the the supply issue because the demand is spiked so much, um, people are starting 
to cut corners because it's just all you know everyone wants to maximize profit so it, it, it starts from the bottom up and then that's another reason too with, with why we're uh, farming right now is just to be vertically integrated so that we know we know everything going on and we don't have to we don't have to worry about um, people cutting corners within that from, from the farmer and onwards yeah that's great well I think we put some had some good conversations some really good information for people to learn more about kava to learn about the process and the culture and what you're doing um, if people are interested in more information about kava fied and the alu ball and what you're doing uh, where can they go to get that you can go to our website at www.getkavafied.com and you'll be able to get our uh, kava from from my family's uh, village um, among uh, two others from from uh, Fiji and Vanuatu and then also our Alubal kava maker and and other kava essentials like uh, the kava strainer bags or your your kava uh, serving bowl and just learn more about all the wonderful uh, cultural aspects of kava as well. Great and I definitely you know I mentioned it before to listeners, I definitely recommend checking it out. I think it's, you know, if you can find good companies to support that are kind of showing what they're doing with uh, the money, I, I think it's a great, great thing to do. And I think Matt's doing some awesome things with Kava Five, so I definitely recommend checking it out. So thanks, uh, Matt, for taking the time to do this today. I, I learned some good things. I'm sure everyone else did too, and uh, I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time, Joe, and thanks for having me. Absolutely.